to the vato that made it cool to be a Chicano. Wherever the Chicanitos and Chicanitas found themselves, when it made sense to stand up for your cultura and the familia that you refuse to forget, when no one else wanted to take you to college and believe in yourself, Sao Castro was there, leading the way down in LA, the city of dreams. Blow up! Was heard in the hallways and still is if you pay attention. Lucha! I always like new scholarship. And I like the way that the students and the professors are putting theory into practice in their writings and the way that uh, Chicano Studies is being really analyzed critically. It's not just like, you know, linear history. It's very rich history that we got to see. Today. by analyzing the relationships between the UFW and five of the major civil rights organizations of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the best uh, outcome for me was to realize that these scholars uh, throughout the U.S., uh, including scholarship they're doing in the West, the Southwest, the North, and the Midwest, uh, are using uh, wonderful primary uh, sources, oral histories, original documents, uh, which documents uh, will not dispute, uh, will not, you know, it's not revisionist, it's original work, it's very exciting work, uh, and they're telling it like it is, the good, the bad, the ugly, the, you know, wonderful outcomes. There's a lot of research being done on women, uh, which is very good because we'll then have a more balanced history. Why do we focus on contraception of all issues when the United Farm Workers was trying to carry out a monumental strike and boycott that needed support? Yet Chavez did not think that he was derailing the conversation away from union concerns by speaking about the pill. He actually proceeded to speak publicly about it on several other occasions. And so now these young women are coming into their own and, and also uh, finishing that whole body of theory. So I would suggest that the students in sociology and education um, and in history, particularly even psychology, you know, study this theory in order to understand uh, their their work holistically. I'm glad I did it, hey, I'm done. <laughs> Mario Garcia, professor of Chicano studies here at UCSB. I put this conference together as the second time we did it in 2012, because there's a lot of new historical literature coming out on the Chicano movement, which was a defining moment in, Chicano, in the history of Mexican Americans. It's the largest civil rights movement by Mexicans in the United States, uh, and uh, and there's a lot of new historical research being done on, on it and bringing importance to it. The discussion today of Latino power is directly connected to the Chicano movement. It's a Chicano movement that gave rise to what we now call Latino power, politically, culturally, economically, and so forth and so on. And uh, so it's a very defining moment, and so I wanted to bring attention to how many uh, historians are really beginning to come back and, and, and study it and assess it and bring in a whole, lot of new perspectives and things that we didn't know about the movement before. Sal Castro uh, was a, a major uh, historical figure in the Chicano movement, uh, teacher, uh, counselor, who encouraged the students, inspired them in the East LA schools in 1968 to do the largest high school student strike in American history to, to bring the issues of discrimination and racism in the public schools historically against uh, Chicanos, Mexican Americans, and other Latinos. Would you like to uh, uh, share some of your memories of Sal as a walkout? But the reason why I walked out was because Although I had given up on myself, I had younger brothers coming up. And um, they were in the seventh grade and eighth grade at the time. And they walked out too with me. But I walked out for them. Because I didn't think I was going to benefit from the things that we had demanded. I thought it was too late for me. 
But I didn't want them to have to go through the same bullshit that I went through as a student. I didn't want their spirit to be killed like I felt that mine was. They came in with their SWAT gear and their mace. And I remember standing like this, facing my aunt or my father or Ken's brother. We were in a circle like this. And before you know it, they threw us down onto the ground. It was mayhem. There was screaming. There was struggle. So I, they didn't know what to do with me, really. They really didn't have me. Where are we going to put this kid? So they sent me to Camp Hess, and I was 13. I tell you, it was a very bad puberty. And we had the sessions, and Sal Castro gave me the chalk. And he said, now, lead the discussion. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm 13. These kids are they're in high school. They're, they're some of the college students. Nobody said anything. By the end of that weekend, we couldn't shut up. The ideas were, were flying all over the room. The thing that fascinated me about that camp was the fact that they brought everybody in, from cholos to cheerleaders, and we laid the stuff down on the table. And I think that's where I'm about. And uh, Sal, whom I worked with and did his book, died uh, last uh, spring, and so I wanted to name oh, yeah. this uh, uh, conference in his honor. Right. Yeah. How often can we say that the words of Sal Castro will live on like fire in the sky? Go to the library, see the name of Chicanos as the American Revolution, or that we have gone into space as Chicanas. Lucha! Rest in peace, Sal Castro. 